Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Whether you are looking for weekly Bible studies, in-depth courses, or talks related to the faith, you will find it at the ICC. Please check out our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. All are welcome to join our growing international ICC family. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or wrap. Our speaker this evening is a priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. Father David Anderson studied under Father Alexander Schmemann at St. Vladimir Seminary and was ordained in 1983. In addition to serving as a parish priest for 37 years, he has been both a teacher and a translator of patristic and Byzantine liturgical texts. He has presented many classes on liturgy and the church fathers throughout the country. He is presently the Byzantine Rite Chaplain at Wyoming Catholic Culture, and he also teaches for the Institute of Catholic Culture and our Magdala Apostolate. Um, so please join me in welcoming back to the Institute, Father David Anderson. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Father Hezekiah. Thank you, Kelsey. Let's ask for the blessing of the Lord uh, that uh, he may assist me to say what needs to be said, and he may assist you to, to hear what needs to be heard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, O comforter, the Spirit of truth, who are everywhere present, and filling all things, treasury of all blessings, and giver of life, come dwell within us, and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy 40 martyrs of Sebast, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I'm glad to be back uh, with uh, this webinar for the Institute of Catholic Culture. I Glad to be able to see those whom I can see, and I know that there are many whose faces I cannot see. Uh, I've been asked to speak uh, this evening on this season that we have entered now, uh, depending on what point you entered it. Uh, probably most of you entered it last Wednesday. Some more have entered it a week and one day ago on Monday, Clean Monday as it's called in the Byzantine tradition. And should we have, and I think we probably do, should we have any Orthodox guests this evening for whom this is the second day of Lent because they follow the old calendar reckoning for the date of Pascha, the date of Easter, and thus the beginning of Lent. So Lent would have begun uh, yesterday. I also asked uh, dear brothers and sisters before uh, I begin this talk, that uh, we be praying, as I'm sure you are, for peace in Ukraine, for relief for its suffering people, suffering and dying people. Let us pray that, that the most powerful force of all, the Psalm 45 says, some boast in chariots and some in horses. We have the modern equivalents of them, but we are strong in the name of the Lord our God. And let us pray that that strength may ascend to the Lord and cause him to exert his strength, his might, he who is almighty and to whom all power is given in heaven and on earth, as the Lord Jesus said before his ascension. Uh, it is easy sometimes for us to confess our faith in the Lord's power in the heavenly realm, but we look at the earthly realm and it does not sometimes seem obvious to us that his power is so directly operating, but it is his is the victory that has been won for creation, for his creation. And of course, 
we have entered into this holy season now so that we might reach his victory and partake of it through the cross joy has come into the world so may the lord almighty father son and holy spirit have mercy on the suffering land of ukraine and deliver it from war and slaughter in reflecting on this season that in the english language has acquired a rather unusual name we use it all the time like we use a number of words we and sometimes don't have the sense of where it comes from maybe many of you do i don't know but this word lent an old anglo-saxon word that means spring spring so lent is associated with the springtime for the same reason that the pascha the passover of the lord is associated with the springtime it's not for any accident that the Mosaic law established that the Passover from slavery to freedom and the exodus from Egypt to eventually the promised land be initiated in the springtime of the year. For it is the Lord who created the times and the seasons. And of course, spring is associated with life. However, in the liturgical texts, and I will do as best I can to refer to a number of liturgical texts in a number of traditions uh, in this talk this evening and our talk next week as well. This season, though, has a very straightforward name, particularly in the Greek and in the Latin. In the Greek, of course, it's simply tesserakosti the 40 days, and in the Latin, quadragesima, the same thing. So it is the 40 days, and, and, and to that is, is added in the Greek, the tesserokosti tessero, the of the nistia, tis nistias, the 40 days of the fast, or in the Latin, uh, the quadragesima, the 40 days of the jejunium, the, the, but likewise, the fast. So this season has in its very name and at its core had the expression of what makes it itself. Now, I'm not going to go any further with this right now, but I will later. But this is a talk on the season of the fast, the 40-day fast. And I uh, uh, interrupted uh, rather abruptly good Father Hezekiah, uh, who was going to tell you a story that, that I didn't know that he was going to do, because I want to tell this story. And it's a story, actually, of the winter time. It's a bit, it, there's a bit of irony, you know, our, our uh, liturgical cycles, our liturgical texts, so many of them were uh, produced in the Mediterranean world, where there is a mild climate, uh, a, a gentle winter, and a nice long spring. But as the faith spread, of course, it, it went to not only other climates, but other hemispheres, so that our, our friends in the Southern Hemisphere are now uh, on the verge of autumn, while we in the Northern Hemisphere are in the, on the verge of spring. However, this is a story about winter because uh, in many places, it's still very much winter, including the place where I live. Uh, I joked with the students here at Wyoming Catholic College who are so diligent in coming to the services and all of the activities of the Byzantine chaplaincy here. Of course, they have the Latin Rite chaplaincy as well, but they are, they are very enthusiastic in taking part in the tradition of the, of the Byzantine Rite, that of the Greek tradition. And uh, in the week before last, when we were preparing for Lent, the week before Lent, there is a beautiful... Uh, hymn that is sung during the divine office, during the Vespers, that says, the springtime of the fast has come. 
and the flower of repentance is opening. And I, I said to the students, well, <laughs> it's going to be a long time around here till we see any actual flowers opening. So uh, this, is a, this is a wintertime story. It just so happens that tomorrow, March 9, uh, which begins the evening before in the Byzantine calendar, we always begin the new day the night before. Uh, so this evening, the saints that are celebrated today just happen to be, just happen to be the patron saints of the Lenten observance, the patron saints of the fast. And they are, as, as Father Esotias mentioned, they are the 40 holy martyrs of Sebast. Sebast is a city in what today would be Armenia. Uh, it's up in the mountains. It's cold. March is still winter. The reason why these, these saints of Sebast, they were not, even though they were in Armenia, they were not Armenians. Uh, although the Armenian people, by the time when they suffered as martyrs in the fourth century, were a Christian people. Yet, nevertheless, Armenia is the easternmost front of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. So the Roman soldiers, the Roman legions that were stationed there in Sebast were guarding the uh, eastern front of the Roman Empire. This is in the year 320, 320. And if you know your history, you might be saying to yourself, well, 320, I thought Constantine, Emperor Constantine, put an end to all the persecutions in the year 313 at, with the Edict of Milan. Well, he did. But Constantine had a co-emperor, an assistant emperor by the name of Licinius, his brother-in-law. And initially, Licinius agreed to Constantine's policy of ending the ban on public Christian worship and ending the persecution against the Christians. But then, you know how brothers-in-law can be, they can uh, turn against each other, unfortunately. And Constantine and Licinius parted ways, and Licinius thought that he the, the best way for him to express his anger against his brother-in-law, Emperor Constantine, was to begin persecuting the church again. So that's what he did. In, in Syria, Armenia, uh, Eastern Asia Minor, that portion of the Roman Empire that he had authority over. So the soldiers in the garrison, the Roman garrison of Sebast, were part of a legion that was very famous for its bravery and its, its military power. They were called the Thundering Legion. But there were 40 Christian soldiers in at the outpost in Sebast that refused to go offer the pagan sacrifices when the commander uh, organized that and said it was a mandatory thing. And if, if, in, if it's mandatory and you're in the military, well, if you don't participate in it, you're gonna be in trouble. And they were. And so they were given the choice of either sacrificing to the idols, to the gods of pagan Rome, or else death. And they, they chose to a man, all 40 of them. There is actually a remarkable document that has survived from that time. It's an authentic document of, of fourth century church history called the Testament of the 40 Martyrs. And all of them either, it's, it, you can see the times, some of them were able to write and they signed their names. Otherwise, they made a mark, but they all signed it. And uh, here's, I'll, I'll even read just a few uh, sentences from it. Here's what they said. We prisoners of Christ salute the bishops, the presbyters, the deacons, the confessors, and all others of the whole Christian world. And then they, then they go on to say that they desire that, that all their relics be kept together, that they not be separated. They want to be together in death, just as they were together in their military life. And then they say, 
we will be on our guard against the deceitful pleasures of this world. We will hold ourselves in constant readiness by a strict adherence to the precepts of our Lord. Then there's a, a list of salutation to the, to the local priests that they know. And then they conclude by saying, we salute you, we the 40 brethren now united in imprisonment and awaiting death. Then all the 40 names or marks are there. We the 40 prisoners of Christ have signed by the hand of Miletios, one of us. We have confirmed all that has been written and we are all in full agreement with it. So their martyrdom consisted in being, here comes the winter part of the story, consisted in being exposed on the ice in the, on the frozen lake outside of uh, the, the, the garrison in Sebast through the night, this night, the night between March uh, 8th and 9th. And of course, that, that death by freezing is, is a terrible death to tempt them to apostatize, to, to deny Christ, uh, the, those who were entrusted, uh, the soldiers that were entrusted with their execution set up a kind of sauna uh, bathhouse with a warm bath that if they, if they gave in, they would immediately be taken from the ice. Not uh, in terms of if they had the advice of modern medicine, not the wisest thing to do to go from ice to a warm bath immediately. Now that comes into the story too. Um, and we are told actually that in, 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 in again, this account of their martyrdom, that when they were led on, when they were led naked onto the frozen lake, they sang psalm, especially Psalm 90. He who dwells in the shelter of the most high and abides under the shadow of the God of heaven, the same uh, psalm that the devil quoted against the Lord in his temptations in the desert. Uh, he will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you ever dash your foot against a stone. So these soldiers, we don't associate generally uh, a group of military men to have this degree of piety, but they had it. This reflects a time in the church where Christians were perhaps, although they had their troubles then too, but perhaps more tested, more tried and true than, than perhaps many now. But they sang psalms as they were taken onto the ice, and there they had to, had to lie down on it. And the effects of their death by freezing began. One of them gave up, gave up uh, and went through the, whether he was fully conscious of what he was doing, only God knows, but went through the, the motions of, of renouncing his Christian faith. And they took him to the bathhouse, put him in the warm bath, and he died of hypothermia. So uh, he, as, and then the, the writer says, so he lost not only the hope in the, in the kingdom of God, but also the hope in this world as well. Simultaneous with that, the soldiers that were guarding the martyred uh, 40, one, one of them saw a vision. And he saw an angel descending from the heavens with 39 crowns. And he knew that there were 40. So the, the crown for the one who had given up was missing. And by, by a sudden, you know, it's one of those miracles of faith, like the thief on the cross that just takes place in a moment. We, we have a hymn uh, uh, that's sung on Good Friday, greatly loved in the Byzantine Rite, about the, the good thief, or literally the good, the good criminal. The wise thief, the wise thief, in a moment, stole paradise. A beautiful, you know, the, that the, the one who's, whether they were thieves or not really is not clear, but that's how we've come to know them. So the wise thief ends his life of thievery with one last act, inspired by his faith in the Lord. So this one, this guardian soldier immediately 
confessed himself to be a Christian, said that the 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 number 40, the 40 uh, soldiers, the 40 martyrs, the numbers should not be missing anyone, went out into the ice, uh, was baptized, <laughs> and died with the others. By the time dawn had come, all had died except the youngest. And the youngest, Miletius, who's the same one that signed his name to the testimony, uh, his mother was there watching this spectacle of martyrdom and knowing that her son would not be want to would not want to be separated from his brother martyrs carried him though he was a grown man carried him in her arms behind the wheelbarrows and wagons that that carried the rest of the bodies of the of the martyrs that were dead and he died in her arms and she she placed him with the others. Their, their bodies were burned, but a number of the relics uh, survived, portions of them. And because uh, Armenia is next door to Cappadocia, Cappadocia in Asia Minor, well, you know who comes from Cappadocia, St. Basil the Great, St. Macrina, his sister, their brother, St. Gregory of Nyssa, the first family of Cappadocia. And they were they became greatly devoted to the forty martyrs of Sebastian. Built a church on their on their property, and from that time, the veneration of the holy martyrs, forty martyrs of Sebastian, as the patrons of of the Lenten season, the Lenten observance, uh, has, has spread throughout the Eastern Church. And it was in the Roman calendar too. One day later, on on March tenth. They put it one day later because March 9th was occupied by a, a very beloved Roman saint, uh, uh, the Holy Francis of Rome, Francesca Romana, as she was known. So she, she kept the 9th, and they put the, the Eastern 40 Martyrs of Sebast on the 10th. And I think they're still there, at least in the martyrology. They're not there in the, in the new edition of the Roman Missal anymore, in, in which uh, many things have, have passed away. But the 40 martyrs who are the patron of Lent, the, the hymns that are sung to them have beautiful, beautiful poetic illusions. We sang in, in uh, tenfold time and fourfold rhythm, uh, that one hymn says. We sang the Psalms to the end to you, O King of all. So receive, and one detail that I, that I left out is that in, in order to hasten their death, those who are taking longer to die, like the, like, the, like the two crucified with Jesus, they broke their legs. And so in the service, uh, poetically, these words are put into the mouths of the 40 martyrs, receive from us, O Lord, what was lacking in your passion by our broken bones. So it is... Uh, a wonderful revelation of what the substance of this season is, this holy fast. Now, having said that, you might think that I'm going to next delve into a presentation of how this ascetical season, and remember that the word ascetical, or perhaps if you're hearing this for the first time, remember that as ascetical, ascetikos in Greek means the same thing as the English athletic. So it is an athletic season. So perhaps you will think that I will begin to speak of the features of this athletic season. Not just yet. Not just yet. For having with this story illustrated its importance on the one hand, on the other hand, it's something that I think you realize, um, because I presume that probably most of our audience are those who are, who are faithful and well-grounded in the life of the church. So you've, you've either read or heard in homilies or maybe classes at, at, at your church about the liturgical year, uh, that Lent hasn't always been around. Lent is not the oldest thing in terms of the church year. 
Uh, sometimes if you, if you ask uh, a group of, and I'm not talking about people who don't practice the faith, but I'm talking about those who do, uh, you ask them, what is, the, what is the climax of the year? What is the most important season of the year? And they will tell you Lent. Not so. Not so. Lent is but a preparation for something that is much greater than itself. So historically, Lent as we know it as a period of 40 days, uh, and those 40 days, by the way, uh, just so we're acquainted with the differences that have developed over time, we are we are one church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We're, we're also a communion of particular churches. And those particular churches all have their, their distinct traditions, uh, liturgical, spiritual, theological, canonical, and so forth. So the 40 days of Lent have been counted in different ways, in different places. Thus, for example, in the tradition of the church in which I live, the, the Byzantine tradition, which was formed in a number of places, but especially in uh, Constantinople and Jerusalem. The 40 days are measured from the Monday of the seventh week before Holy Week. Excuse me, the Monday of the sixth week before Holy Week. So, uh, Holy Week is not considered part of Lent in the Byzantine tradition. So Byzantine Christians, Catholics, and Orthodox will use the expression Lent or Great Lent. Sometimes we call it Great Lent, the Great Fast. Great Lent and Holy Week plus Holy Week uh, because the two are distinct. So for, for those in the Byzantine rite, Lent lasts from the Monday of the sixth week before Holy Week until the Friday before Palm Sunday, which is precisely 40 days. And then you have uh, Lazarus Saturday, the day before Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday and Holy Week. And that's another distinct uh, part of, of it's, it's what Lent has prepared you for. In the Latin tradition, there's been all kinds of things that have happened over the centuries. Initially, it took a while for the 40-day Lent to, to uh, be adopted in parts of the, of the Western church, the Latin uh, church, so that for a while it was only three weeks. Then it was extended to the full time, but the full time was measured differently. Uh, it included Holy Week up until Holy Thursday. So up until and, and including Holy Thursday, but because they did not include the Sundays in the counting of the 40 days. Now in the Byzantine rite, we do, but they did not include the Sundays. So uh, that meant you only had 36 days and they needed four more. So between the, around the end of the, of the, first millennium, it's not an ancient thing, the four days beginning with Ash Wednesday were added. Before that time, Lent began on the first Sunday of Lent in the, in the Roman church. In fact, in the church of Milan, the Ambrosian rite, Lent begins on Monday, just as it does in the Byzantine. So there's different ways of counting, but it's the same season of 40 days, and of course the number 40 is inspired by the fast of our Lord uh, in the wilderness where the gospel makes clear to us that he ate and drank nothing, as I have my tea. <laughs> now, this season begins in some places toward the end of the third century and other places beginning of the fourth, by the end of the fourth century, pretty much everybody's got it. But before that time, you see, from the days of the apostles following the ascension of our Lord and Pentecost, the earliest days of the church, 
from the days of the apostles for about 300 years, no such season was known in the church. What did the church have during that time? It was very simple. They had the weekly celebration of the Lord's Day, the day of our Lord's resurrection, which they love to call the eighth day, meaning that you can't fit the content of the Lord's resurrection into the seven chronological days of the week. It's something beyond all that. It's the first day of the new creation. It's the beginning of the day without evening that the apocalypse, the book of Revelation mentions. The day that has no night, the day of eternity, the one day of the eternal present of God that is revealed by Christ's victory over death when he rises to a life that death can no longer touch. So the celebration of the Lord's Day, that is always present in the church from the apostolic age. Likewise, from the first century, and this is mentioned in a book that is not in the New Testament, but before the content of the New Testament was finally decided in the fourth century, the New Testament canon, one of the books that sometimes was included in the scriptures of the New Testament was a document called the Didache, which uh, the full title is The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles to All the Nations. So it is, it is from the apostolic age, but is, it's not regarded. The final decision was that it would not be included in the New Testament, but it still would be treated with reverence. So, uh, the, you know, in the, in the fourth century, they had to sift through all of this Christian writing. And the, so the Holy Fathers did this, and they basically made, <laughs> if you want to, just on <laughs> a mental image, they had three categories. One was of apostolic and therefore inspired and therefore in the New Testament canon, the Gospels, the Epistles of St. Paul and the rest. Then there, was, then there were those writings that were considered false, false gospel, heretical gospels. Uh, gospels that bear the names, that bore the names of people who really didn't write them, and that taught doctrines contrary to that of the apostolic tradition. That's the second category. The third category was writings that were considered uh, good to be read and edifying, but not to be considered on the same level as Holy Scripture. And this would include something like the Didache. Well, in the Didache, we have a description of a great many features of Christian life in the first century. And we're told that in addition to the Lord's Day, that the Christians fast twice a week on Wednesday and Friday. And the point is made that those days are chosen because they are patterned after the Lord's passion. Now, of course, it's clear to us how Friday is, but also Wednesday, because it was on, the, on Wednesday that Judas made the agreement to betray our Lord. The betrayal itself takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane, but the agreement to, to do it when Judas goes to the chief priests in advance is on Wednesday. That's why, by the way, in the, in the popular terms, the popular names that, that are in the, in the Roman calendar, the Wednesday of Holy Week, sometimes called Spy Wednesday. So uh, Wednesday associated with the betrayal Friday associated with, with, of course, the Lord's passion and death. The Didache says that uh, the Pharisees, remember the Pharisee boasting about how he fasted twice a week. The Pharisees fasted on Monday and Thursday, but the Didache says we will fast on Wednesday and Friday. And the way they did that is found in other early Christian writings. Uh, there's a book called The Shepherd of Hermos. There's also some of the Acts of the Martyrs that tell us that on Wednesdays and Fridays, the Christians would not eat or drink anything until after three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour. Why the ninth hour? Obviously, the ninth hour is the hour of our Lord's death. 
even now the modern, you know, the modern devotion, 20th century devotion of the divine mercy actually has roots far, far, far long ago in that keeping of the ninth hour, the hour of the Lord's death, calling it the hour of mercy. So these things all hold together sometimes in ways that we don't even know. We don't even recognize a lot of them. So in the early church, that's what they had on the level of, on the, level of the week. They had the Lord's day and the two fast days. On the level of the year, however, and this is what's taking us to uh, Lent. On the level of the year, they had one season, one season. And it was the season that in the early church was called Pentecosti, Pentecost. And we think of Pentecost as one Sunday, the 50th day from Easter, you know. But that's not what it meant in the early church. It included, of course, those days. But it meant all the 50 days, the whole 50 days from Pascha, which is universally in, in all of the scriptural languages and patrist patristic languages. That's what we refer to rather strangely, by the way, in English as Easter from the old uh, Anglo-Saxon word for dawn. But Pascha, the, the Passover, that's, that's the early Christian way of referring to it, and the Eastern churches still uh, use that, and so do the, so do the uh, Latine uh, Western churches as well, and all the, in all the Latin-based languages, it's, you know, Pascha, Pasqua, uh, Pasqua. So, this season, which was preceded, now, now bear in mind that in those, in those first couple centuries, there's no Lent, there's no Holy Week, not yet, not yet. What there is, is a Paschal Vigil that lasts from the descriptions that one can read of it from those times, that lasted all night, all night long, from Saturday to Sunday, with the exception, I don't want to go into too many details, I don't want to distract you, but except for some of the churches in Asia Minor, Asia Minor is where Turkey is now, some of the churches in Asia Minor that followed what they claimed to be, this would, and this would be such people as St. Polycarp and St. Irenaeus, claimed that they received this from the Apostle John himself, John the Evangelist, John the Theologian, as we refer to him, uh, that they would keep their Paschal Vigil on the very night of the Jewish Passover, whatever day of the week it fell on, not, not waiting till Sunday. Now, our practice has been now since the Council of Nicaea for 1,700 years to keep the, the Passover of the Lord, the Paschal of the Lord, on the Sunday after the Passover moon. But in the early church, there were, there were those churches that kept it on whatever day Passover fell that year. So they wanted to keep that link to the Passover, the Jewish Passover. However, everyone has this one-night Paschal Vigil to prepare for it. They fast for either one or two days, a total fast for one, of, one or two days. Then as, uh, by the third century, you, you read accounts of how this one or two days of fasting has been extended out into the week. So it's the beginnings of Holy Week, the beginnings of it. But at that Paschal Vigil, they did many of the things that we do in our Paschal Vigils in the various rites of the church. They read scripture and the passages are, are, are noted because the one of the oldest sermons that we have, the Paschal homily of a uh, second century bishop named Melito, Melito of Sardis, the same Sardis as the seven churches of the book of, of, book of Revelation, you know, Sardis is one of them. So Melito of Sardis has, gives us the first written Paschal sermon, and he's preaching about how the exodus and the sacrifice of Abraham, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Of course, Abraham does not physically sacrifice Isaac, but the fathers all remind us that from his will, from Abraham's will, he does offer the sacrifice. 
obeys. He does obey, and he's only stopped by the angel. So the sacrifice of Abraham, the creation, the seven-day seven day creation, six-day creation, rather, and God rested on the seventh day, and that rest of God following creation is seen to typify, to foreshadow the literal rest of the Son of God who dies on the cross and on the Paschal Sabbath is dead, is with the dead. So this one night, Paschal Vigil, with the proclaiming of Scripture, within many places and, so, and, not, and before long in every place, many baptisms, many baptisms, and then the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, and then the breaking of the fast, and then the continued celebration for 50 days, because 50 days pass on the scriptural rhythm from the resurrection of the Lord to Pentecost, the last day of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit. So the Christians celebrated for, for 50 days, and we're told in many, many sources, in, in all of the early languages, uh, the uh, Greek, Latin, Coptic, Syriac, Armenian, that this celebration for 50 days was characterized especially by not kneeling and not fasting. So it's rejoicing in the resurrection of the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the defeat of death. Now, by the time we reach the fourth century, the same time when the, the 40 martyrs of Sebast are suffering, the same time when Constantine has ended the persecution of the church and he and his mother, Helen, are building all these wonderful churches and basilicas throughout the empire, and especially on the holy sites in Jerusalem and in Palestine. So one of the great bishops, great uh, saintly bishops of the fourth century, Cyril of Jerusalem, he's, a, he's bishop during this time. And now, of course, Christian worship is public. It had been in house churches hidden away before this time. Now it's public. It involves increasingly large groups, numbers of people. And so in addition to that, you have all these wonderful buildings and basilicas and shrines that are being constructed. Uh, the first of which, of course, is the Church of the Resurrection itself that covers the, both the area of Golgotha, where our Lord was crucified and died, as well as the tomb. So Cyril devises this day-by-day -day celebration of the mysteries of the Lord's final week before his death and resurrection, each day having its particular commemoration. And there in Jerusalem, of course, you have all these wonderful new churches to have all these wonderful new services. And pilgrims are coming from all over the place because Christians are free now to, to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So they go to Jerusalem and they experience this new uh, celebration of Holy Week, and they go back home and they say, well, we want to have that here too. So that's, that's a, a kind of short description of the birth of Holy Week. But along with that comes also the extension of the fast. I mentioned first from one to two days, then to six days, then finally to 40 days. And the adoption of this fast as a preparation for the season of feasting. This is where we have to begin any uh, reflection on what we are doing during this time. Because unless we see that the resurrection comes first. And only because of the resurrection, only in the light of the resurrection, does the celebration of the Lord's life and suffering and death and burial have any content at all. For St. Paul says, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is empty. He is risen and our faith is not empty, but we enter into the mysteries of his life 
and sufferings and death by means of the resurrection. The resurrection comes first, not last. We're not in a season in which we're pretending that the resurrection hasn't happened. Uh, you know, in, in the, again, in the Byzantine tradition, the priest or the deacon is always uh, kind of waking the people up by exclaiming, let us be attentive, let us be attentive, let us attend. So, and that's exactly what it is. It's let us attend. It's not let us pretend. <laughs> we don't pretend on Good Friday that we don't know what's coming. That's silly. Rather, because of the resurrection, we are able to enter in with greater depth into the mysteries of the Lord's passion and death and burial. Because we see that his voluntary self-sacrifice made it possible for the last enemy to be destroyed. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's death that is, as St. Athanasius the Great says, it's death that comes between us and God. Death is the disease. Sin is the symptom, but death is the disease. And until the disease is healed, it's not possible for human beings to reach the destiny for which God has created them. If we look at the apostles themselves, we see that they came to the crucifixion through the resurrection. How many of the apostles witnessed our Lord suffer and die on the cross? One, John. Where were the rest of them? The rest of them were locked up in the upper room. They were terrified, terrified. It was it was too much for them in their weakness. When the risen Lord came to them on, on the night of, of, his, of the day of his resurrection and said, peace be with you, and breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, he was recreating them. They were, they had lost everything. And only by his coming to them in the strength of the resurrection could they be reconstituted as the apostles? You will remember in the Acts of the Apostles that after the ascension of our Lord, the apostles go back with the, uh, some of the other disciples and with Our Lady to the upper room, and there they pray for 10 days between the ascension and Pentecost, but they also have some business to take care of, uh, the first item of which is a replacement for Judas. And Peter says what's necessary for to be a candidate to replace Judas. He says, first of all, it's got to be somebody who's been with us from the days of the preaching of John the Baptist. So all through the time of the public life of the Lord, and even before, from the days of the preaching of John the Baptist, says St. Peter, then it's got to be someone who has seen the risen Lord. Notice that St. Peter does not say that the criterion for being an apostle is to have witnessed the crucifixion, because if he had, he would have thrown himself out of the ranks of the apostles, along with the rest of them, except for John. Now, is this just some sort of, of uh, isolated thing, or does it reveal to us something essential about the Christian life, the life of the disciple? I, I'm quite convinced that it's the latter. And what it reveals is that our faith, our hope, our love are rooted in the resurrection of the Lord, in the joy of the resurrection. Your joy no one shall take from you, promises the Lord. And only where there is that joy of the life that can no longer be touched by death, is there any possibility of someone to go out and bear witness to the truth and to proclaim the gospel and to even suffer martyrdom? So in other words, to put this very simply, for our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he goes through the crucifixion, to the tomb, to the resurrection, to the right hand of the Father. 
for his disciples, at least most of them, they can only bear the cross because they have encountered the risen one. In that wonderful church of the resurrection in Jerusalem, there were directions for how the processions would take place. The processions in the church of the, uh, now it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but it was not then called the Church of the Resurrection. The traditional processions, we might think they would start at Golgotha, start at, the, at Calvary, where the, the place of the Lord's death, and go to the tomb. They do not. They start at the tomb and go to Golgotha. Now, this again, this is not just some little ceremonial uh, uh, detail. It's as the liturgy of the church does, it reveals to us the content of the faith. We are baptized into Christ. We have put on Christ. We have, we have died with him, yes, in the likeness of his death, but we rise with him in the likeness of his resurrection. And having risen with him and having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, as the letter to the Hebrews said, and tasted the goodness of the Lord, then we can go out and do our asceticism. So Lent comes from Pascha. Pascha doesn't come from Lent. Okay? And our first part. Well, since I went a bit over <laughs> in the first part, I better not do that in the second part or we won't have any question time. So I'll, I'll try to restrict myself to the next half hour and then we can have our questions. Um, now, I, I concluded the, the, the first part of this evening's presentation by not only affirming the uh, relationship between Lent and the Paschal celebration, but also wanting to make a very strong point that it's the Paschal celebration that produces Lent. In other words, the reaction of the church to the experience of the Paschal joy in the risen Lord is the ascetic life. Now, maybe this sounds obvious, but let's think about it for a moment. Because I think that there is um, rooted in us a kind of attitude in which we see, and again, I'm not suggesting that there's not some truth in this, but it's easily put out of balance. And what I mean is, we see that we, we or rather we have this we, we have this image, a spiritual image, that if we struggle enough, if we suffer to the extent that it is given to us to suffer, if we endure to the end, and I, I'm deliberately using uh, expressions from scripture, the Lord does say, he who endures to the end will be saved. St. Paul does say tribulation produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This is Romans 5. And hope does not disappoint us. So all of that might sound as if, well, yes, it must be that I, I have to endure through everything that is asked of me, the taking up of the cross, every, every aspect of the taking up of the cross, whether those things that are visited on me from who knows how, or those things that I have brought upon myself, or those things that other people may, may do to me. All the sufferings of the world. My, uh, now, when I was initially asked to give these two talks, uh, I was asked uh, to, to use the book Great Lent that's written by my teacher, Father Alexander Schmemann, and I will do so. However, uh, I, I, I wonder, I have to say, 
I wonder if if those who invited me had realized that uh, they they also informed me rightly so that uh, most of my uh, most of my audience for these two talks would be Catholics of the Latin Rite, and therefore uh, it would not be appropriate to to go into too many intricacies of the specifically Byzantine way of keeping Lent, and I agreed with that. However, in addition to, to asking me that, they also asked me to base my talk on a book that is, in fact, entirely inspired by the particular uh, observances of Byzantine land. So it's rather difficult, in a sense. However, uh, you know, my, my teacher, Father Alexander Schwemann, would would over and over again emphasize the danger of a kind of imploding, introspective uh, fascination or obsession with suffering as kind of an end in itself. And that I think is a point that has to be seriously taken because suffering is not an end in itself. Suffering is a means, just as Lent is a means. And Lent, in particular, is a means inspired by the reality of the, of the joy of the Lord's resurrection. So it's not simply fighting the battle all through life. And, and finally, you know, St. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And now there waits there is, there, I, there is waiting for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will bestow on me. And there's, of course, how, how can one take issue with St. Paul? And I'm not taking issue with St. Paul. However, how is St. Paul able to say all that? St. Paul is able to say all that because he is knocked down and blinded with the light of the risen Lord. That's how he can say all that. And then even, and after that happens, when St. Paul, this happens to, to him right outside of Damascus, he goes into Damascus to where he's been sent to one of the disciples, Ananias, he gets baptized. Then he who was trying to, to uh, destroy the church, the Acts of the Apostle says he wreaked havoc in the church, that he was a full-fledged religious terrorist. If you want an image of St. Paul before his conversion, a mental image, look at one of the images in the media of religious terrorists. That's what St. Paul was like. He presided over people's deaths, not seemingly wanting to get his own lily white hands too dirty. He guarded the clothes, the cloaks of the men stoning St. Stephen, but he would not uh, uh, he would not condescend to throw, to throw a few rocks himself, leave the dirty work to others. So St. Paul is not, Paul of Tarsus is not an attractive figure. How is he able to be transformed in such a way? Well, here's another very revealing thing. What the Lord says to him, uh, there's numerous accounts of the conversion of St. Paul, three of them in the Acts of the Apostles, and one of them in his own words in the letter to the Galatians. And in the ones that are in his own words, not done through the narrator, St. Luke is the narrator of the, of the Acts of the Apostles. But the one that, the, the description in his own words is that the Lord Jesus, when he knocked him down and, and flooded him, blinded him, I mean, is he for is is Jesus having a forced conversion here? Is he forcing St. Paul into conversion? That's the question, because our Lord does not violate our free will. He says to Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Referring to his, he doesn't say, why do you persecute my church? He says, why do you persecute me? Because where the body is, there the head is, and where the head is, there the body is. Which means, by the way, as St. Paul says, we already reign above the heavens with Christ. Apurani is, he says, above the heavenlies. We reign with him, even while we suffer on earth. I'll say more about this later, the two dimensions of the church's life and why we have 
fasting and feasting and why we have anticipation and fulfillment and why they are both necessary. That I think is gonna be saved mostly for next week. But in addition to saying to St. Paul, why do you persecute me? The Lord says something that sounds a little strange. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You have to, if you're not used to having to, uh, you know, uh, direct animals, uh, you might not know what that means, but a goat is a pointed stick that you poke the animal with to make him go the way you want him to go. So the Lord Jesus is saying to St. Paul that even before this, while, even while Paul was persecuting the church, that persecuting of the church was kicking against the goads. In other words, there was a part of Saul of Tarsus that knew, even as he persecuted Christians, that knew it was all true and was kicking against it. So in that context, he is blinded with the light of the risen Lord. They, uh, he starts preaching Jesus, whom he had previously been trying to destroy the followers of Jesus. They have to, they have to ha help him escape from Damascus. They have to let him down in a basket through a window. And then, then he says in his own words, in the account of his own words, he didn't go right away to Jerusalem to meet the other apostles. He went into the desert, into the desert for three years, he says, not just 40 days, but three years to be alone with God. And only then did he go up to the apostles in Jerusalem, who originally, initially were all afraid of him. And it took some persuasion. But when, when they were persuaded, they, they accepted the, the legitimacy, the authenticity of what had happened to him. But see how that conversion is rooted in the resurrection. And then all of pa Paul's efforts and his sufferings, he has to, he, he's on the other end now. He's, he's, he's going to suffer some of the sufferings that he inflicted on other people before his conversion. They're going to be inflicted on him now. But that's only possible because it's rooted in his encounter with the risen, glorified Lord. It's another image of how Lent is the product of Paschal joy. And until we get that, Lent is always going to be seen in a negative light. Lent is always going to be seen as a time of deprivation and self-punishment. The reason why I, I began this evening by mentioning that Lent has always been referred to as the fast, the great fast, the 40-day fast. Never in the history of the church for 2,000 years, uh, as, far as, as far as one can tell, has there been so few people observing the fast. For at least since the 4th century, when Lent got its form that we have now, the 40-day form, depending on how you count the days, there has been a way of observing it. And it's not a way that you make up. It's a way that proceeds from the life of the church, comes from the experience of the church. Fasting and specifically means something. There's a way to do it. Naturally, you know, we're not automatons. You know, uh, th There are variations in this. But nevertheless, there is a received experience, discipline of fasting that has existed through most of the history of the church up until the 20th century, basically, which has, for the most part, in modern times, simply been discarded and replaced with giving up candy bars or something. Now, I'll get back to that. But... In the liturgical texts of the church, and if you want to know how the church experiences this season that we are in, the best way to do it is to consult the liturgical texts. 
if you are if you are as I probably as I think I'm right, most of you are of the Latin right. Look at the prayers and readings of the mass. Look at the prayers and and poetry of the divine office, the liturgy of the hours. That's where you'll find how the church expresses her experience of a season. Don't, I would advise, don't simply leave it to your imagination or, or, or me leaving it to my imagination. Imagination, the fathers of the church, I have a very wise approach to the imagination, which basically can be summed up by saying that the imagination is part of us. It's, it's part of our, our, our soul, but it's the most unruly part. It's the, it's the part that's most given to imbalance. It's the part that most needs not to be, not to be crushed, not to be suppressed, but uh, here's my little phrase for it. It does need to be kept on a leash. <laughs> and the leash that, is, that it is kept on is a balanced mind and will. The intellect and the will. The Lord's gifts to us created in his image and likeness. The, those two things are related, but they are distinct. Uh, the mind that thinks and the will that chooses. Faculty of thought and choice. So that's where the ascetical battle is fought and hopefully won. In the light of the resurrection of the Lord. Now, I'm going to treat you to a few liturgical texts from, again, the tradition that I live in, because I have a, a familiarity with them. I love them very much, but also uh, because they have a great beauty in establishing this link between the resurrection and our preparation for it. So, for example, listen to these words. With great joy, O faithful, let us receive the divinely inspired announcement of the fast. Like the Ninevites of old, like the harlots and publicans who heard John preaching repentance, through abstinence, let us prepare ourselves for communion at the master's liturgy in Zion. Let us cleanse ourselves with tears before he washes our feet. Let us pray that we may see the fulfillment of the old Passover and the revealing of the new. Let us prepare to adore the cross and resurrection of Christ our God. Let us cry aloud to him. Do not put us to shame, O lover of mankind. Do not deprive us of our expectation. Now, this says a number of things, this text. First of all, it says that the season of the fast, the Lenten season, is to be received with joy. It is not a gloomy time. It has an aspect of seriousness, of course. It must be taken seriously. Its content is a serious one. But being serious does not mean being gloomy. Uh, one of Another text that comes to mind that we sing on the day that we begin Lent in the Byzantine tradition, we sing, let us set out on the path of the fast with a light step, with a light step, not with a heavy trudge. We are not prisoners in some sort of confinement. We are taking this upon, a, upon ourselves in joy. The joy of what? Well, that's the next focus of the text, and it's been the focus of my talk the whole evening. So let's receive it with joy, and let's receive it like those people in the great city of Nineveh, which Jonah preached to, and he didn't like doing it because he had a certain stinginess about him. 
and he didn't want the people of Nineveh, those, those uh, pagans, those Gentiles. He didn't want them to have the favors of the Lord. And he was angry. So he preaches, and they take his preaching seriously, and they start fasting. And he, has, he, he goes off and sulks. So he doesn't want them to do it. He wants, but they received his word with open hearts. Like the Ninevites of old, like the harlots and publicans who heard John preaching repentance. The same thing with the preaching of St. John the Baptist. The gospel tells us that it was the sinful people who received the preaching of John with joy and responded to it. Whereas the people who characterized themselves as the righteous, not just the Pharisees, but those who were, who were observant of the law, like the older brother in the parable of prodigal son, that, that, old, that older brother who does externally all the, all the right things. He stays at home. He obeys his father, although he never calls him father. He does his work, but you open him up, and inside there's nothing there. There's no love. Never calls his father father, never calls his brother brother, calls his brother this son of yours. He doesn't have anybody. All he has is this external structure that he has fashioned that allows him to convince himself that he's righteous. And it's hollow, whereas the wild younger son, and the, and the wild younger son, make no question about it, is a sinful boy. He's a bad boy. But that's not all he is. Because even in his unruliness, and it's very unruly, he asks his father, you know, father, give me what I'm going to get from you when, I'm de when you're dead. I can't wait till you're dead. I want it now. And his father does it. And then we know what happens. But when everything goes bad for him, what comes to his lips? My father, in my father's house, everybody has enough. I will go back to my father and I will say to my father, father, I have sinned against you. Rembrandt, maybe you've read, there's a, a meditation on the Rembrandt painting, or a parable of prodigal son. Rembrandt, in his, his portrait of that, of that young man uh, shows him in, in, he's just a mess. He's just nothing left of him but a few rags, except for on his shoulder, there's a little piece of his garment still left on one of his shoulders that has a purple stripe. That's the color of royalty, of course. In the Roman Empire, you have to be in the imperial family to wear anything with purple in it. He, and what is that? He knows, even though he's so sinful, he knows that he's the son of his father. And his exteriorly obedient brother has nothing. No love. The Pharisee, uh, maybe some of you have heard some of my talks. This is one of my beloved uh, references. The, the Pharisee in the, in the parable if it's read in an accurate translation, I hasten to add, because unfortunately, accurate translations don't grow on trees. But an accurate translation of the, of the parable of the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector is, the, is, it says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, saying, I thank you, God, <laughs> that I am not like the rest of men. In other words, he is so deluded, he thinks he is praying to God. He is not. He doesn't know God. He, in, in all of his perfect observance of the law, he does not know God. And instead, he's praying to a projection of himself. How many relationships are ruined by false projections of the self? Relationships between friends, between spouses, and between human beings and Almighty God marred and ruined because all we're doing is projecting an image of ourself on the other. Lent is to get out of that and to be free. And that can only be fueled by the joy of the Lord. So the 
back to our text. The sinful people heard John's preaching with joy, and we are invited to be like them. And through abstinence, that is through asceticism, through ascetic labor, in other words, through athletic, spiritual athletic, let us prepare ourselves for communion at the master's liturgy in Zion. Communion at the master's liturgy in Zion. Those words are just loaded. It's not simply saying, let's prepare ourselves for Holy Communion, although when, I, when we do receive Holy Communion, we are having that partake. But this is saying something somewhat in addition to that. It says that we are having communion at the Master's liturgy. The word liturgy means an act, a work. The Master's liturgy is his voluntary and therefore singular, voluntary, self-sacrificial death for the life of the world and his resurrection. This liturgical text says that we can have communion at that liturgy. It's not, you see what I'm saying, it's, it's not simply saying, oh, let's, let's go to Mass or the Divine Liturgy and receive Holy Communion. It's saying something uh, that is deeper, actually, although there's nothing deeper than, than, in this world than the Holy Eucharist. But in order to have its depth, we have to access the depth. It won't happen automatically. The effects, the, the reality of the sacraments come from God. Of course, God initiates the sacraments. We don't, the priest doesn't. But the effects of the sacraments, the effects of the sacraments proceed from us, how we receive them. So communion at the master's liturgy in Zion means that we are invited to be in the presence of the death and resurrection of Christ our God. And I hasten to add, this is not an imaginative pre uh, present. This is not a remembrance of past events. That's not what Catholic Orthodox liturgy is about. And how much damage has been done by subjecting the liturgy of the church to the effects of imagination. The liturgy is not an imaginative act. It is the intersection of eternity and time, of God and man, of the not yet and the already. That meet, that meet, because what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for the life of the world is not something that can be compared with what any other human person has done for the Lord. Jesus is not a human person, strictly speaking. He is a divine person with a human nature, yes. He is fully God and fully man, yes. But the I, in quotation marks, the I, the acting subject in the person of Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the Father, Therefore, his, what he does in crossing the threshold from eternity into time and taking upon himself our humanity, our humanity, when we say in the creed, uh, unfortunately, neither the English nor the Latin really captures the original Greek. When we, take, when we say in the creed that he took flesh, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man, it's saying something rather deeper than simply became man. It's not saying uh, one more has been added to the population of the human race. One more human person has come into existence. No. It's saying that a divine being, an eternal being, the only son of the father, has taken upon himself the humanity of the human race of each person in the human race, not the creation of another human person, but a divine person who takes upon himself the humanity of everybody. And he takes that humanity through the cross and through the tomb to the day that knows no evening. 
That is the master's liturgy that he accomplishes in Zion. And that's what we anticipate and prepare for in the Lenten observance. So time already to, to bring this to a close and have our question time. So this text concludes, let us pray that we may see the fulfillment of the old Passover and the revealing of the new. So what is old has passed and what is new, unique in him, singular in him has come. Let us prepare to adore the cross and resurrection of Christ our God and cry aloud to him, do not deprive us of our expectation. Do not deprive us of our expectation. That is the language of anticipation. For there to be a, a fulfillment, there must be anticipation. That's why we fast. Feasting generates the fast. The joy of the resurrection generates the ascetical effort. We don't fast to be gloomy. We don't fast to punish ourselves. We fast to anticipate our expectation that we receive from the master's work, the master's liturgy performed in Zion for the salvation of the world that he loves so much, the father loves so much that he gives his only begotten son. So that's my introductory talk for tonight. Next week, we'll maybe talk about some more of the particulars as they have developed of the Lenten observance traditionally. And uh, maybe through the both of them will provide uh, uh, some, some, some food for, for reflection. So I, I hope that that these that these uh, words of mine, however in, insufficient they may be, have, have been of some some help for you, and ask for all of your prayers for me. And, I, and I'll end with that, and we can have our question time now. Thank you so much, Father David. You certainly provided a lot uh, food for thought. I think, yeah, that was incredible. Why don't I open the floor to see if anyone on screen here has a question? Angela, let's go ahead and start with you. I was just curious, um, your thoughts on, I think the Western church probably had a lot bigger problem with Pelagianism. And I'm wondering if that also has to do with why we probably went to the other extreme and have such a minimal fast now compared to the Eastern churches. That's a very good question, Angela. Now, uh, from our from uh, our audience the, whose faces I can see, uh, is, is Pelagianism something familiar to you that you understand? You want me to say a little bit about that to answer the question? I think it would be helpful if you could briefly define it. That would be great. Well, uh, Pelagius, from which is derived Pelagianism, just as the heretic Arius, from which is derived Arianism. Pelagius taught an unbalanced an unbalanced expression of the Christian life insofar as now the reason why I say unbalanced, because that's what is at the root of all heresy. A heresy is an imbalance. It's not necessarily all false. In fact, one of, one of my professors, the, the God rest him, the great Father John Meindorf, who taught me the church fathers, would say to us, remember, most heresies are at least 90% true. It's the 10% that gets you. you have to, so you have to see that imbalance. Now, the, so applying that to the, the question at hand. So Pelagius was not entirely wrong, not entirely wrong. He taught that we could, by our own efforts, advance towards salvation. He did not agree, for example, with uh, the two, of course, the two that are at, at odds, just, just, as, just as Arius and Athanasius, you know, are at odds. Arius is the, Arius is the standard of heresy. Athanasius is the standard of, of orthodoxy. In the case of Pelagius, he's kind of a standard of, of unbalanced teaching about salvation. And Augustine, St. Augustine, on the other hand, well, he is, he is in some ways the opposite extreme. 
So what I, what I mean is this. Arius, or excuse me, Pelagius taught that primarily the Lord Jesus saves us by being an example for us. And you can see how th there is truth in that. We are told that we are to pattern our life on the life of our Lord Jesus. We are told that this is not an impossible thing for us to do. We are told that we are to have the mind of Christ. We are told that we are to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is truth in Pelagius' teaching, but it is a kind of salvation by pulling yourself up and relying on your own energy to cooperate with God. Now, Pelagius, who was, who was no dummy, most, most of the, the heretics aren't, Pelagius would never say that the grace of God is not necessary. That, that would be putting words into Pelagius' mouth that don't belong there. Augustine uh, wanted so to stress the necessity of God's grace that sometimes St. Augustine makes it sound like we are so badly messed up that it's impossible for us on our own to do anything that's any good. So, for example, why did... Uh, why did some of the central names in the Reformation uh, make the claim that we are totally depraved? Calvinism is based on a doctrine of the total depravity of man. Well, Calvin got that by exaggerating Augustine. So an exaggeration of maybe of a certain exaggeration that Augustine had uh, that we are we have lost the image of God. We're not capable in any way. Now that, we, on the other hand, we have to say, you know, are not people in the scriptures uh, described as righteous? We're not Zechariah and Elizabeth described as being righteous and blameless before the Lord? So we clearly don't believe it. We don't hold it with the doctrine of total depravity. Now, sometimes St. Augustine can sound like he's almost to that point, then he kind of draws back. So he's reacting, as, as Angela says, he's reacting against Pelagius, against this self-salvation. Now, the, the way uh, Angela applies it in her question is also revealing, because many of the, uh, you, the, the ascetics in the early church, we think of the great names, you know, people like St. Anthony of Egypt, who went out and lived uh, for more than well, more than half a century in the wilderness, who lived lives of such in almost incredible self-denial that it's almost uh, uh, it's impossible for many people to imagine even imitating so much of what the saints did. Say. Or you can even go to even more extreme people like St. Simeon the Stylite, who lived on a pillar for 40 odd years, you know. And uh, people nowadays might look at that and say, well, isn't that just trying to trust in your own spiritual strength, trust in your own righteousness? Well, these are saints of the church, so, so certainly it's a lot more than that. But there is, there is a truth, there is a, a degree of truth, it seems to me, that um, a kind of hyper-Augustinianism, hyper-Augustinianism, uh, can result in a kind of allergic reaction to ascetical practice, because it, ascetical practice through the through hyper Augustinian eyes can seem as thinking that you can save yourself through these these works of, of righteousness or ascetic labor. But on the other hand, uh, and, and and now uh, it is true also what Angela says, that, that uh, Pelagius uh, was much more of a problem in, in the Western church. The, the East simply said, well, he's a little off, or, uh, a little off balance, but it, didn't, uh, it wasn't a big issue. Although, 
although they they agreed that he was that he was a heretic in the East at the, at the uh, Third Ecumenical Council Council of Ephesus. So maybe maybe the allergy that modern people have now in the church to such things as you know. Uh, the traditional fasting discipline, which I'll, I'll say something about that next week. Um, but it's the traditional fasting discipline, whether it's observed in the traditional Roman way or the traditional Eastern way, is a, is a, a, has always required great effort. It's not easy. Not easy. And maybe some of the allergy to it, uh, along with, you know, we have, especially in, in our conditions where we're used to having, at least most of us are used to having what we want when we want it. So we have gotten soft. So deprivation does not come easily to us. Um, but maybe it's also because of, of a kind of uh, an, uh, hyper Augustinian anti-Pelagian thing that, that uh, that ascetical programs of asceticism are kind of suspect of, of uh, uh, too much too much uh, focus on on one's own efforts and not enough trust in the grace of God. Does that address your question, Angela? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Our next question is coming in from Laura and has to do with one of the later reflections of your talk. Um, Laura is wondering what it means to um, for something to be, quote, performed in Zion. Can you give some context for those who oh, might not be familiar sure. with that phrase? Sure. Sure, I can. That's that's a, a good question. Yeah, yes, the master's liturgy performed in Zion. Well, there's a number of levels to that to that expression. Zion, of course, is the place of the, of the temple, the Temple Mount, first of all. Zion is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Zion are used interchangeably in the Psalms, in the prophets, for example. So it's now what is, what is Jerusalem? What is the temple and the place of the temple? Where the, the place of the temple is where you go to, as far as it's possible, to cross the threshold that ex that experience that expression is used uh, entering the temple is to cross the threshold from time to eternity to be in the presence of god uh thinking of how the temple was described as sometimes even visibly covered with the glory of god the shekinah as it's, uh, as it's described so the temple is the dwelling of of god's glory that's why when saint john in his gospel Speaking of the incarnation, he said the word was made flesh and literally uh, tabernacled with us, pitched his tent with us, dwelt with us. It's, and we have seen his glory. So there, remember, of course, that in the gospel, the Lord says he's the temple, temple of his body. So from the original historical, even geographical, place of Zion, the door is open to, to it being the place of where one meets God. Now, Jesus makes it clear that that is the place to which he must go. He cannot, he cannot die, he says, outside of Jerusalem. It can't be just anywhere. It must be there. It must be at the Passover. None of this is accidental must be at the Passover, because the Passover sacrifice is the sacrifice of deliverance, and he has come not just to deliver people from Egypt, but from death and give them eternal life. So the master's liturgy performed in Zion, first in the, in the context that it's used in the liturgical hymn, means that the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection from the dead, which takes place at a specific place, at a specific time, literally becomes for those who, who believe in him, he becomes, his church becomes the new Zion. So we go from the, the uh, old Zion, the old Jerusalem to the new. What comes to mind is what uh, St. John says in the Apocalypse, book of Revelation, uh, chapter 21, then I saw a new, a new heaven 
and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, behold, among men, the dwelling place of God. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. And then it goes on to say uh, in the same chapter, I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Now, uh, whenever you ask a question about Zion to a, a uh, Byzantine tradition, uh, Catholic, you're, you, you will inevitably get this reference to one of the most beloved hymns of the church. It's the Paschal time hymn to the mother of God. Those of you in, in the West uh, who know the, the Paschal time uh, uh, Latin, uh, you probably know it in English, the Regina Celi, you know, the, the, the Easter hymn to, the, to Our Lady. Here's the one that we sing uh, in the Byzantine tradition. Shine, shine, O new Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Exult now and be glad, O Zion, and be radiant, O pure Theotokos, mother of God, in the resurrection of your son. So in that sense, the mother of God is spoken, is addressed also as Zion. But of course, ultimately she is addressed that way because she is the prototype of each one of us by God's grace. So we become Zion. We become that meeting of heaven and earth, time and eternity, God and man, the, the first creation and the new creation. So that's some, that's some thoughts about Zion. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Father. Father David, could you give us your blessing before we part? Father is our hope, the Son is our refuge, the Holy Spirit is our protector, all Holy Trinity. Glory be to you. Beneath your protection, we take refuge, Holy Virgin Theotokos. Do not despise our supplications in our necessities, but deliver us from harm, O ever glorious and blessed Virgin. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.